We're looking at Hebrews 11. And uh, the idea of home is a powerful thing, I think. Even the, I- the idea of, of home. I think if you were to stop just for a moment and think like, if you were to think where, where is home, what is home, probably some ideas, some thoughts, some smells would get conjured up in your mind, particular foods, places, sounds. I know for me, if, I, if, if we, I grew up in West London in Ealing and if we drive back there, my parents are now just around the corner, but if we drive back to the house that I grew up in, I know I can drive up the avenue and then turn left down College Road and something in my heart begins to like stir you know and you see those kind of old ghosts of of yourself and memories and things and it reminds you of a of a place anyone know what i'm talking about like that feeling of like safety security i remember when i was like growing up four five six seven all i cared about was my bmx and football nothing else mattered there was no politics there was no economics there was no finance there was no news to worry about it was just me my friends football forever. it was there was a sense of kind of safety to that what happens for us is that we grow up <laughs> and we leave that place of safety and security and we move towns we move cities we move to universities and colleges we get jobs and suddenly we experience the, the pressure and sometimes the loneliness of, of, of life. And then you move to London, a city filled with people who are trying to find a home, a city filled with displaced people, exiles who are trying to find where is my home, where is my rootedness, how can I get back that feeling that I once had in a city that just feels overwhelming so much of the time? Is anyone resonating with me? We have this deep longing in our hearts for that place, that thing, that smell, whatever, that thing that is home, I think. It's deep within us. Some of us, we ache with a longing for our homeland. Sometimes all you wish you could just go back for a moment just to be back in your family home, to eat some of your mum or your dad's cooking and to just be at peace there and yet you find yourself here if you're a christian what happens is added to that you're part of the culture and you get called out as soon as you say yes to jesus you get called out of the culture that we're in and suddenly you have this double whammy not only are you in a city filled with exiles and people trying to find a home while being displaced but also you're now a christian walking against the culture at large you are doubly out of whack with the society because you have no home in this world everyone else seems to be walking another direction and something in your heart continues says but i want to follow christ and we're told in the scriptures that we're described as sojourners and exiles david in psalm 39 he calls himself a guest in this life living as a christian feels much more like being in a hotel room than being in a home that you actually own you're always feeling like am i quite at home am i resonating i think we can do two things with this feeling this longing this aching that we have we can either do one thing we can try with all of our might to accumulate all the experiences and friends and things that will hopefully ground us somewhere in this life and regain that feeling of safety that we once had as a child so we go from experience to experience and if that doesn't work we blame that so we blame the uni we blame the college we blame the city we blame the church we blame the friends and so we go from one thing to another to another trying to find that feeling of togetherness and connectedness and rootedness and home and safety but it never arrives and so we're continually eluded by this sensation that we're trying to get back and so we just keep flitting through life and many people just live their life ping-ponging between experience to experience hoping that the next one will be the place where they actually feel grounded at home that's one way we can do it we just exhaust ourselves trying to find it in this life the other way we could just go about it is kind of just quiet quit on life just think ah like i'm here but deep down in my heart i've given up on ever really kind of experiencing new things joy 
And so you're available, but you kind of live in the open shadows. You, you're kind of there, but you're not actually giving your heart to anyone or anything. You've given up that actually life will be anything than just what it is. And so you just go into this mode of ticking over until Jesus comes back, if you're a Christian. You just give up. Neither of which I suggest are a good idea. I'm saying that's what we do. Some of the times we do that at the same time. We're like quietly giving up while equally flitting between experiences, thinking, is this going to be the next one? Maybe this person, this job, this relationship. C.S. Lewis, he wrote this, and I probably read this quote like once a year, and this is my annual opportunity to read this. So I want to read this to you because this chapter in this book on hope in mere Christianity revolutionized my understanding of just what I was actually going through in my late teens. Continually I was in this endless list of hobbies that I was going through thinking this is going to be the thing that actually connects me somehow with life. And C.S. Lewis says this, if I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, including that longing for home, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. If none of my earthly pleasures satisfy, that does not prove that the universe is a fraud. Probably earthly pleasures were meant to sat not to satisfy it, but only to arouse it, to suggest the real thing. If that is so, I must take care on the one hand, never to despise or be unthankful for these earthly blessings. And on the other, never to mistake them for something else of which they are only a kind of copy or an echo or a mirage. He says, I must keep alive in myself the desire for my true country, which I shall not find till after death. I must never let it go get snowed under or turned aside. I must make it the main object of life to press on to that other country and to help others do the same. That's the point of this message today. That you and I, and we as Trinity Church London, would be those who don't put our trust in this world, but lift our gaze to the horizons and look to the future and the city and our place that is to come. That actually all of these longings and these achings, we take them, but we take them through the experiences of life and beyond them and take our hearts all the way to our true home, where one day all of our desires will be satisfied in the life after this life in glory with Christ when we see him face to face. My, my, my hope, my longing, my prayer for us is that we as a people don't make bad decisions with our life and our finances and our relationships and our traveling and where we're going to be next trying to pursue this thing called home when it is not in this world it's to come and that we don't give up on life but we continually make ourselves available to others to love them and to serve them and to engage freely as God's people as exiles while we live in this place so that we could be a blessing wherever we go in this dark place. The charge is to keep our eyes on the place that is to come, the home that is coming for you and I in Christ Jesus when we die. And what we're gonna do is just simply look at this man Abraham and this lady Sarah and how they navigated this feeling because they experienced what it was to live in a place that was not their own. And they navigated this well with their hope set in the right place. And because they did that, they left the legacy which we are now living in as Esther. So I thought you were gonna start preaching there, Esther. I was like, I was gonna close up my Bible and go home. <laughs> we're living in the, lake of, in the wake of this man and this woman, Abraham and Sarah. So let me just set the scene for us about who, who these guys are. Sometimes over time, you do enough things, you kind of, you get a warped idea. But Abraham and Sarah, they actually grew up as, as city dwellers and they grew up as very wealthy, well-to-do people. Abraham grew up in Ur, which was one of the mega cities of the day. They were traveling, we're not sure why, to Canaan and they stopped in a place called Haran. And we're told later in Genesis that within Abraham's household, there were 318 trained men. These weren't his children, these were salaried men who were there to support the household. This is a large 
entourage. Jay-Z would be blinking and taking double takes at Abraham's entourage as he rolled into town. Three, some historians estimate that with this kind of uh, amount of trained fighting men, there are probably about a thousand who were a part of his household, who were salaried by Abraham. He was a wealthy man, he was a well-to-do man who was respected and he was part of his culture. He was within the mainstream, people looked up to him. And so this wealthy man comes and he gets spoken to by God. And the first we really hear about him is when God speaks and he tells us this in Genesis chapter 12, where God says to Abraham, Now the Lord said to him, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you and I will make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Isn't that amazing? I don't know, I mean, I've been prophesied over in the past and I've, I've gone to conferences as a young, ambitious man hoping to do well in life and I've been wanting to be prophesied over. Has any Christians ever been there in that place? I want, I want some kind of like, and you, you might receive something and you'll get a, a word or someone shares a scripture for you. And almost inevitably, if you're like me, what you hear is excitement, joy, blessing, uh, promotion, spirit, new spiritual plane, like glory unto glory. Every time you hear like a word, like you think, is it just me? You're a little staring at me like, well, you're vain glorious, aren't you down here? Yeah, like maybe I am. I'm just confessing to you in that case. But I hear it, I'm thinking, oh, this is gonna be exciting. You hear the good bits, right? You think, God spoke to me, that must mean I'm moving up, I'm going in, and there's glory to come. Watch out, I'm arriving, here I am. You, like there is this, but actually what happens so often in the Bible that when good things are promised, it involves pain, loss, sacrifices that you don't know. And maybe it's God's gift that we never know in the first place because we wouldn't take a step forward. But as you take that step forward in the promises of God, you realize this doesn't quite feel like what I was expecting to feel. This is Abraham's experience. I can imagine him hearing, I will make your name great all the families of the earth will be blessed but what potentially he didn't quite understand was leave your country leave your family and leave your kindred and all of the pain and aches and agony that would leave him with for the rest of his life and all that he had to deal with he had to leave his place his country with all of the smells and the sounds and the familiarity that that was to him. He had to leave his kindred, his culture, that, those people who just got him. You know those people like where you probably grew up? People who are just like you, they just, you kind of click with each other and you just know there's no like second, it's just like you understand almost without talking. He had to leave his kindred and, and go and travel. He had to leave his family and all of the wrenching loss that that was, and live without Zoom, without phone calls, in a land that was not his own. And what we're told is that Abraham went. He, he left. He heard the call of God and he left all of this behind. And just imagine this, this feeling, and I, I think it's such a resonant thing for us in our society because he was a man we're told who lived in tents which symbolizes this sense of a, a, a lack of roots he lived once in a home established respected wealthy and he let go of his lifestyle his position everything that he knew was familiar and he began to walk a life that was unfamiliar and alien as an exile and sojourner for the rest of his life we're told that he began to walk, but he didn't know where he was going, which is an interesting thing. I've often like wondered how, I literally, practically, how actually did that happen? Do they leave Haran and go like, right, the city gates, do we go left, left or right? We, we don't know too much. This is my guess. In Hebrews 11, we're told that they were traveling to Canaan from Ur and they stopped for some reason in Haran, halfway. And so I think probably they thought, well, we need to go 
we were going to go to Canaan, let's start walking in that direction. I, I don't know. If anyone has wisdom on this, let me know. Sometimes when God calls you, you just have to start moving. You take the cues from around you, you take wisdom, you take counsel from mothers and fathers in the faith and you think, okay, I have peace in my heart. God said something, so we have to start moving. I have to make the phone call. I have to send the email. I have to talk to that person. I have to start making plans, even though you don't know where you're going. Trusting God that he is faithful to his promises and he will be with you every single step of the way. Amen. And so he went and traveled and what we're told is in Genesis 13 that as they arrived into the land of Canaan God spoke to them again it's interesting how God speaks to us when we're walking by faith as we are on the journey very often he doesn't give us the full download while we're sitting on our sofa in an evening going like, you tell me everything I'm going God says no you go and I'll talk to you as you go on the journey and we're told God says this the Lord said to Abraham after the Lord had separated from lift up your eyes look from the place where you are he is now in Canaan northward southward eastward westward for all the land that you see I will give to you and to your offspring forever I will make your offspring as the dust of the earth so that if one can count the dust of the earth your offspring could also be counted and he says, arise, walk through the length and the breadth of the land, for I will give it to you. So Abraham moved his tent and came and settled by the oaks of Mamre, which are at Hebron. And there he built an altar to the Lord. So you have to imagine Abraham and Sarah being promised this great promise that this land is a bit like you kind of settling into a flat share in East London and receiving this promise from God. Oh, by the way, London will one day, it'll be yours. And you're thinking, hang on a minute, like I've got a room with a smelly kitchen. I'm sharing with five other people. And you're telling me that all of London is going to be mine. This was Abraham's promise. He's in the middle of this land that he does not own or know. And God says, this land is going to be yours. And not only that, but you are going to have descendants as numerous as the dust of the earth. And they are childless. It's funny in, in Hebrews 11, I just noticed it when it talks about Abraham. And he says, is he, the writer is a bit cutting. He says, and Abraham as good as dead. <laughs> I'm like, well, thanks. That's really kind. You know, this is a man who is walking. He's as good as, look at that man. He's as good as dead. I'm not pointing at you and put me, sorry. <laughs> they were childless. And so how does this promise work out? The reality is that actually... They stumbled and they failed in their faith time and time and time again. It's interesting, we look up to Abraham in particular, the father of now three worldwide religions. More than half of the earth would look to Abraham as the man of faith, like the example, the blueprint of what it is to walk by faith. And yet Abraham, time and time and time again, took matters into his own hands to try and make the promises of God happen rather than trusting God. He made bad decision after bad decision. He would make the same bad decision twice, we're told in the scriptures. They broke their marriage covenant, trying to take this promise into their own hands, trying to make it happen so that they could have a child that they could call their own, not trusting in the promises of God. And yet, while Abraham and Sarah were faithless, God, who spoke, was faithful. Amen. God spoke. And so neither our plans, nor our sins, nor our failure will get in the way of God's promises. If God has promised something to be, it will be. You may cause yourself harm and problems along the way by not trusting him. But when God has spoken, it will come to pass and so what we're told Abraham when he was as good as dead they were, had the child of promise Isaac unbelievable promise that was given to them and they have this son so at the end of their life you have to imagine Abraham and Sarah with their one son Isaac in the middle of this land with these promises and they die like that they don't actually see anything else you, God, you promised me these things. 
you, you promised me this land, you promised me these descendants, and all I have is me living in a tent with one son. Sometimes we look to our life, I think, and the metrics of our life and how successful our life looks or feels as to the metrics as whether God is coming through or not. Does anyone know? Like you look around your life and think, well, there's not, there's not much here. Like what, what, what is it that's happened in my life? You get to 40, you know, the grand old age that I'm at now, and you have your existential crisis. You do start wondering about these things. You all went very silent there. I'm s joking, semi-joking, not joking. <laughs> about to cry, but I'm fine, really. <laughs> you think, what? What is my... What? What is my, what, what has it come to? You think, where are my, the relationships that I hope for, the family, the, the lifestyle, the, I thought it would be different. And yet I've got these promises that I'm living with. We don't walk by sight, we walk by faith. God has a much deeper, broader, bigger, better plan for you and I and this church than what we can see right now we have no idea the legacy that we are leaving in our wake you have no idea what your life is sowing into others that will one day we reap in one two ten twenty generations that you will one day enjoy when you meet jesus face to face all abraham and sarah had at the end of their life was one son in a tent yet they had the promises and they died staying faithful and what we're told is that God, who remains faithful to his promises, saw it that Isaac had two sons. And one of those sons had 12 sons who then became the nation of Israel. And one of those sons, Judah, he had a great, 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 great grandson called Jesse, who had a son called David, who was anointed by a man called Samuel to be the king of all of these 12 tribes of Israel. And this David, he ruled over all of the nation and he took the land of Canaan to himself, but still only in part. And he died still not having seen everything fulfilled. And he had a son called Solomon and a son called Rehoboam. And he had a great, 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 great grandson who had a son called Jacob, who had a son called Joseph, who happened to be married to a young woman called Mary, whom angel Gabriel spoke to and said, to you is going to be born the king of the Jews, and he is going to be called Emmanuel, God with you. And through him, the nations of the earth are going to be inherited for his people. And this Jesus grew up, a man who was despised, stricken, who experienced loss throughout his whole life. Christ, we're told in Hebrews 12, is the author and perfecter of our faith. He has gone before us. So the loneliness, the sense of displacement, you live as an, as an exile, is nothing that Jesus does not know. He knows it more. He used to live in glory with his Father and the Holy Spirit, in splendor, with his kindred, with his family, in his place. And he left the throne of glory and came down to us and walked with us on this earth as an exile, as a guest here. He left everything that was behind, all the pleasures of glory. And he lived as a, a poor, penniless preacher, persecuted for seeking the kingdom to come in his generation. And he was finally pushed out of society, lost, ultimately displaced when he was crucified on the cross. And all the way through, trusting the Father that the promises that he had spoken, that there would one day be a people drawn to himself, redeemed to himself, trusting that that would come to pass, trusting that all the promises to the suffering servant in Isaiah would be fulfilled through him so that even when he goes to the cross and is displaced out of heaven and on earth and he experiences all of our hell and sin on his own body as he is plunged into darkness, he is trusting continually by faith in God his Father, knowing on the other side of this, though I can't sense you right now, I trust your word that you will raise me from the dead and my soul will be satisfied and I shall see the redeemed come to life in glory and what happens God the Father raises him from the dead hallelujah Christ trusted the promises and we follow in this man's wake Abraham and Sarah exiled through their whole life 
Christ lived on the earth, exiled through his old life, crucified, resurrected, and right now is gathering to himself those descendants who are as numerous as the dust on the earth. Could you have told Abraham and Sarah one day over two billion people would be worshipping that God that you trust him just because you remained and you endured and you stayed faithful to God and you died still with promises unfulfilled? Would they have believed you? And we now live in their wake because they simply lived their life by faith. It was a small life. I mean, like uber wealthy, but... All they had was a son and tents. That, that, that was it. You think you look, look at my life, it's small. I, I, I can't, I can't what, what is my life amounting to? What have I done spiritually? You have no idea what's coming. You have no idea the legacy that you're leaving. If you will engage in the world, love people around you like Christ loved you. It's a powerful feeling, home. And it's our charge to walk faithfully, knowing that he who promised is faithful to all that he's said. So God might have called you to London. And you know that you are called to endure for this season. And you are to remain by faith, loving those around you. God has called you to trust in him that one day glory is coming. So don't make those bad decisions with your money and relationships. Look to him. He will come through on all of the promises because our home is coming. Jesus told us that when he is raised from the dead, he is going to go and prepare a place for us, a place do you not know that Christ knows exactly all of the emotions when you go back home to your hometown or your home city, to your parents' home, whatever it might be? Do you not know that he knows that? And he is going to create a place for you in glory that will be tailor-made for you, where you will sit down at the dinner table and everything as you exhale in that moment will be made right. You will never look back on life and think, but what if? Because you are home with Christ. He is going to arrange everything perfectly. And not only that, you are going to have some stories to tell from all that you lived through with him. John got to see the city that is coming that Abraham looked at. And John saw, and he said, this is what he saw. He saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more, no more sin, no more chaos. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, the home that we long for, the glorified world that is to come. He saw it coming down as from heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain any more for the former things have passed away and he who is seated on the throne jesus christ he says behold i am making all things new so please church friends brothers and sisters would would we stop trying to find our home in this world and look to the future realm. We won't be disappointed. There'll be nothing in glory where you think, oh yeah, but Jesus, the day calls not quite to what I... Everything will be satisfactory to your heart. You will be a round peg in a round hole. All of that feeling of being dislodged and displaced in this life will be washed away because you will be home with Jesus Christ, amen.